What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, Trace at Sneakers.com. I've been rolling through a lot of these most commonly prescribed medications and I want to move on to the medication duloxetine, also known as Cymbalta. Now if any of you remember, and you can probably look this up, there was a really funny kind of marketing campaign and, and commercials that were created for this medication. And it, it went something like this. When you're depressed, who do you want to see? No one. Where, where do you want to go? Nowhere. Depression hurts. Cymbalta can help, right? This was like the funny, I mean, to me, it was very funny the way they were kind of presenting this information and kind of presenting the way Cymbalta could potentially help somebody with depression. And they may have, of course, overstated those claims a little bit in the marketing. But we'll talk about the medication because a lot of people are taking it. It's very commonly prescribed. And it actually may be prescribed for some disorders that you may not have expected. Right? You may think of it as a depression medication because that's kind of how it was, it was marketed, but there's more to it than just that. So let's get into some of the details about this medication and what makes it sort of unique and why uh, you know, it may help some people with depression but may also help with some other disorders. So Zimbalta, like some of the other medications we've talked about, namely venlafaxine, Cymbalta is a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor and is classified as an antidepressant primarily. It has FDA approvals for a number of things. Of course, it has FDA approval for major depressive disorder. It also has FDA approval for some medical things like diabetic peripheral neuropathy. It has FDA approval for fibromyalgia. It also has FDA approval for generalized anxiety disorder and for chronic muscular skeletal pain. So this medication could sometimes be used for somebody who has a lot of somatic or physical complaints associated with their depression. So if they have like a lot of pain associated with their depression, this medication may be a good choice for that person. So we may prescribe in that case. If somebody has comorbid diabetes and has peripheral neuropathy, that's another good place for it. And it's one of the few medications approved for fibromyalgia, which we can talk about in another video if anybody's interested in a discussion on fibromyalgia. Now the mechanism of action is going to be actually quite similar to venlafaxine in many ways. We're going to be boosting norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. So what this does is it blocks the serotonin reuptake pump, similar to all other antidepressants. It also blocks the norepinephrine reuptake pump. And since dopamine is in the prefrontal, since dopamine in the prefrontal cortex, in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, dopamine is actually largely inactivated by norepinephrine reuptake. The same kind of the same kind of pumps that you would you would see in other parts of the central nervous system. There's inc there's going to actually be increased dopamine in the prefrontal cortex as well, and it does act to weakly block dopamine reuptake as well. So there's a little bit of a dopamine component here, which makes it a little more unique than say things like venal. Well, it's kind of similar to venal I shouldn't say that. It, it's a little different, but again, so there's some dopamine as well. Dosing for depression is 40 milligrams per day and you're going to divide that up into two doses usually so possibly something like 20 milligrams twice a day and it can be increased to 60 milligrams per day in a single dose or divided dose with a maximum of 120 milligrams per day so the 120 milligrams can be divided in doses if necessary for neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia the initial dose is a little bit higher it's actually 30 milligrams per day and you're going to have a target dose of 60 milligrams per day. There is not much evidence to support doses higher than 60 milligrams per day for people with neuropathic pain or fibromyalgia. So you want to cut it at 60 milligrams. If the person's not having success there, they should probably think about a different medication. For generalized anxiety disorder, again, it's different in terms of the initial dosing. You're going to start at 60 milligrams per day, so start a little bit higher, and you're going to get to a maximum dose of potentially of 120 milligrams per day. Um, I found if people don't have a lot of success by 60 milligrams, they don't have that much more success at 90 or 120. And then what ends up happening is the side effect burden becomes more of a problem because you're on much higher doses than what is generally needed to treat those disorders. In most cases, like I said, 60 milligrams is a good dose and you should start to see an adequate response at that point. Although some people will require more 90 milligrams, 120 milligrams a day but there is not much research to support doses over 120 milligrams per day and if you were to do that you best be an expert in that area of treatment and know and know the consequences and potential risks of going above the 120 milligram mark 
doses of 60 milligrams, like I said, for fibromyalgia or neuropathic pain are the best. There's no evidence to support a significant improvement above 60 milligrams. So that's your cutoff for neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia. With this medication, like with venlafaxine, you're going to want to monitor blood pressure prior to and after prescribing Cymbalta. It's can be it's essential. You need to know that the person's not getting hypertensive as a result of the medication. If you're stopping the medication, it's always a good idea to taper it to avoid withdrawal symptoms, especially on the higher doses. So if you're on 90 or 120 milligrams, you're going to want to taper that off over a few weeks minimum and possibly even longer, depending on how the patient's responding to that situation. Notable side effects. They include the things that you would expect with most of these medications, nausea, diarrhea, decreased appetite, dry mouth, constipation, which is dose dependent, insomnia, dizziness, sweating, sexual dysfunction, sedation, increased blood pressure, and another interesting one, which this is actually used for in some cases, is urinary retention. So people who have urinary incontinence, sometimes this medication, Cymbalta or Duloxetine, can be used for people with uh, stress urinary incontinence. Augmentation experience with this medication is a little bit limited. It's not as common, although it follows the same principles as venlafaxine. So you could pretty much you supplement this medication in place of venlafaxine in the California rocket fuel formula that we've talked about in previous videos. So to summarize this whole thing, duloxetine works well for the painful physical symptoms of depression. It does have the risk of causing hypertension, similar to venlafaxine. It's not well studied in things like ADHD, although it has been explored for this purpose, doesn't have FDA approval for it. And like I said, in some countries, it is used for stress urinary incontinence. So it's a good medication. It's a different, it's a different mechanism, again, than your traditional serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And this may be a medication that people respond to if they didn't do well on plain serotonin reuptake inhibitors. If you guys have questions or comments about duloxetine or Cymbalta, I'm happy to answer them below. Please drop them there. And uh, like and subscribe to the channel. We'll keep you updated on the latest medications as well as the most commonly prescribed ones.